<laughs> yes, you can't. These are as long as I go. Yeah, yeah go. that's it. I might that's get it. a little bit longer sometimes. Yeah, I think these are too long. I'm not yeah. sure. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, from swimsuits to looking like a Kardashian, we want to stick to those food trends for the summer. What have you is to go it alone. You do nobody any favors, not you or your baby. If you're trying to hang on to a man who causes your heart to break even before your water, there's no more serious responsibility than raising a child. So you don't need to be bringing someone so irresponsible as your cheating lover into your home. Yes, he made love to you. Now make sure he's ready to love you and your child and to show it. If not, show him the door. Till next time, take care of yourself. News 11 at 4 starts now. A St. Louis teen is charged in connection with a crash that killed five people on Mother's Day weekend. Now the latest on the investigation and the timeline of events that led up to the deadly crash. A chorus of chainsaws could be heard in this Kirkwood neighborhood today. A look at the damage left behind from the EF0 tornado and how cleanup is going. Temperatures on the rise, the heat is on, and as the heat builds, thunderstorms will flare. We'll let you know which part of the weekend so you can plan around the storm. Last night's storms brought damage and flooding. We are talking with an expert from Metropolitan Sewer District on what the agency is doing to help reduce flooding. The Blues returned to home ice after a big win in Denver, Colorado, tying the series one to one. We'll tell you what Coach Berube had to say after the win. But first here on News 11 at 4, a St. Louis man now behind bars after a deadly crash that killed a family of five Mother's Day weekend. News 11's Kelly Hoskins has the charges in the investigation and surveillance video that captured events prior to the crash. A prosecutor's charged 18-year-old Marshawn Stephanie with a slate of felonies, including armed criminal action, leaving the scene of the accident and second-degree murder. St. Louis police say Stephanie was driving a stolen Jeep when he crashed into an SUV that killed five family members of one family. The deadly crash happened Mother's Day weekend. Police say Stephanie crashed into Aaron Piggy's family. Piggy lost his mother, sister, two uncles, and his niece, all innocent victims. We have to bury five people. And we have my niece, who's 11 years old, they didn't even get the chance to experience homecoming, prime, and walk across the streets like I did. That hurts. Authorities released a timeline of events which led to the deadly collision on Del Mar Boulevard and showed a surveillance video that captured parts of the incident. Investigators say just before 9 a.m., the Department Real-Time Crime Center received a hit from its license plate recognition system that Stephanie was in a stolen Jeep Cherokee. The Jeep swerved and hit an Infiniti SUV, and a passenger in that Jeep fired shots at the Infiniti as the Jeep sped away. When officers tried to pull over Stephanie, police say he drove off at a high rate of speed, striking the victim's vehicle. Police Chief John Hayden say they do not have any information that officers were pursuing the vehicle, but said police did try to deploy spike strips to stop the vehicle. This collision occurred less than 29 seconds after the spike strips were deployed, and the distance traveled was just under two city blocks. At this point in the investigation, we have no evidence to suggest that our officers were involved in a vehicular pursuit or that the use of spike strips contributed to the crash. The evidence at this time points solely to the criminal conduct of the suspects in the Jeep. In response to this crash, the St. Louis City and County chapters of the NAACP want to talk to local police chiefs. The NAACP says data collected on police pursuits makes a strong case for opting not to pursue. They're calling it a public safety emergency. In downtown St. Louis, Kelly Hoskins, News 11. New here at 4, police in Ferguson are investigating a homicide that happened last night. Police were called to Copper Creek Drive around 6. That's where they say they found a man lying unresponsive on the pavement. Life-saving measures failed and that man died at the hospital. Police believe, do not believe this was random. Anyone with information should call Ferguson Police or Crime Stoppers. The Crime Stoppers number is on your screen. We remind you, you can always submit any information you might have and remain anonymous. Those heavy storms yesterday flooded Interstate 55 at Loughborough for more than an hour in South St. Louis. 
On News 11 at 7 last night, our meteorologist Angela Huddy brought us video of the tow trucks that were clearing the last of the vehicles stranded in that flash flood. The flooding was caused by clogged storm drains in the area. First responders could be seen waiting in the water to clear them, along with rescuing stranded passengers. MoDOT is assessing the situation today. Our Dan Gray met with officials and we'll have more on their response coming up for you tonight on our sister station, Fox 2 News at 6. We have seen quite a bit of tree damage in the St. Louis area and the stretch of Spady from Highway 40 to Clayton Road was closed for a time. And you can see why multiple branches and trees in the street. The damage went as far up as Maryland Heights and Ladue and it has left a big cleanup on people's hands today. Time to check in for the first time with Chief Meteorologist John Fuller, who was tracking those storms all afternoon and evening. He joins us now as we talk a little bit more about the strength of those storms. Yeah, along with the severe weather team, uh, we encountered you know severe weather for several hours yesterday, and the storm surveys by the National Weather Service completed, indicating at least seven tornadoes, and we'll list those out. There were two EF1s and five EF0s. Here is the list as we plot them on the screen. Leslie, Missouri had 100 mile per hour one, uh, 100 mile per hour winds, EF1, EF1 at Breeze, Illinois, and Greenville, 110. That was the strongest one. And five EF0 tornadoes, one at Frontenac, one at Oakville, Illinois, one at Creve Coeur, Missouri, St. Clair, Missouri, and Kirkwood, Missouri, in the range 80 to 85 miles per hour. Here are some of the storm reports all on the map, and there were numerous reports as the severe weather situation continued throughout uh, the latter part of the afternoon with a dose in the morning hours. Now another cool front is on the way. How cool? Several inches of snow expected in Denver, Colorado and a round of thunderstorms for us overnight tonight. It's quiet on radar, no precipitation. We do have a level one, which is a low risk overnight tonight in the wee hours of the morning. Right now, temperatures are warm and steamy. 88 here, but only 66 in Kansas City. It's 85 in Chicago, so you can see the impact of that uh, cool frontal system across northwestern portions of Missouri. We have heat indices near 90 degrees. So fair skies early on, clouds increase mid-evening, and scattered thunderstorms mainly confined after midnight. Could see a, a few before that, but we think after midnight with rain and thunderstorms on Saturday, some of those a little bit stronger, especially focused down to the south. More on the timing and the impacts of the next round of thunderstorms in a few minutes. Mike. All right, John, thank you. Yesterday, storms caused flooding on area roadways. We already told you about I-55 in Loughborough. News 11's Ala Arabi spoke with MSD about how the agency will prevent future storm flooding. We are joined by Sean Hadley with the um, Metropolitan Sewer District. Sean, talk to us about what your agency is doing to help reduce uh, flooding. So what we're doing is we've invested over six and a half billion dollars into the uh, St. Louis region sewer system, which, which is the wastewater system. The, pro the issue we have, though, is that our unfunded side is our stormwater problem, and that's what you're seeing, like with um, we've seen all these like uh, localized flooding issues, creek, creek erosion, and stuff like that. And so what we've been trying to do is trying to one encourage um, the community to you know, invest in green infrastructure. Um, also, you know, we're looking at trying at some point trying to get a, a, some sort of a capital funding source so we can actually help our residents, our customers with uh, addressing um, localized flooding and erosion. So it's a big thing that we're trying to do here. But out here where we are right now, which is kind of timely because it is raining on us, that um, we're right by a rain garden with a uh, Cortex. And the Cortex area has been one of our greatest partners to adapt the uh, green infrastructure with our rain gardens. And um, just, you know, they've been a good partner with um, wanting to help reduce the, uh, the flow that comes in the sewer systems and help the water quality. And so it's a good, a good, a good example of what you can do um, to help reduce, you know, again, the amount of rain you're getting. Now, a rain garden's not going to solve a big downpour, but it will help reduce that flood or the water over time. And, you know, it's one of those things also, it's a good, it's a good thing to help in, the, in a community to help your neighbors. Like if somebody upstream or up, up on the top of a hill has a rain garden, that's going to help that person at the bottom of the hill. So it's, just, it's, a, it's a good, you know, it's a good thing that, you know, to look at implementing in your, you know, in your area. Definitely, Sean, thank you for that information. Great advice there as well. Again, Sean Hadley with the Metropolitan Sewer District. For now, we are in Central West End. I'm Ella Araby.
Well, it was a thrilling start to the second round of the Stanley Cup playoffs. The St. Louis Blues now tied with the Colorado Avalanche with Game 3 shifting tomorrow night to St. Louis. News 11's Ty Hawkins brings us some of the highlights. The Blues return to the Enterprise Center with a chance to take a 2-1 lead. This comes after a big Game 2 win in Denver, Colorado, where they beat the Avalanche 4-1 on Thursday night. Let's take a look at the highlights. Second period, Jordan Cairo scores from the right circle. His fifth goal of the playoffs put the Blues on top, one to nothing. Still in the second period, Blues on the power play. David Perron scores to make it two nothing Blues. Third period now, two one Blues. It's Perron again with his seventh goal of the playoffs. The Blues add an empty netter and win game two, four to one. Jordan Bennington with another strong showing at the net. He had 30 saves. You look back to last year, they beat us four straight. Then they beat us the first game. That's five in a row. Um, you know, I think guys realize, you know, we've got to step up and we've got to beat this team. So they did tonight. That's really what it boils down to. Uh, yeah, it was important to, to find a way to win one here on the road, just like we did last time uh, against Minnesota. And uh, kind of keep pushing forward here. We know it's going to be a long series and we're going to play hard every game. And uh, now we're, we just got to get some rest and prepare for the next match. The boys are putting the puck in the net this season. Listen to this. In the postseason, Jordan Cairo joins a list of players who now have five or more goals in this postseason. He joins O'Reilly, who has six, Perron, and Vladimir Tarasenko, who has five, giving the team the most scores with five or more in the playoffs. The series now heads to St. Louis, tied at one game apiece. Game three at seven, tomorrow night at Enterprise Center. Game four is Monday night at 8.30. Reporting from the Enterprise Center, Ty Hawkins, back to you. And those are your top stories here at 4 o'clock. Still ahead this afternoon, inflation running rampant, impacting the American consumer at the grocery store and the gas pump. We'll tell you how inflation jitters are having an effect on elections. Plus, a rare but potentially serious virus makes its way to the U.S. How CDC officials are reacting to the first monkeypox case and what you need to know about the symptoms. President Biden focusing on foreign policy as he makes his first trip as president to Asia. But here at home, the economic woes are adding up with stubborn inflation, high gas prices and a critical baby formula shortage leading to the lowest poll numbers of his presidency. Caroline Shively has more from Washington. For the first stop on his Asian tour, President Biden got a look at a Samsung computer chip factory, the model for a $17 billion plant set to be built in Texas. This investment will create 3,000 new high-tech jobs in Texas and add 
To add to 20,000 jobs, Samsung already supports. President Biden spoke in South Korea, but his message was also targeting an American audience struggling with inflation, a baby formula shortage, and gas prices that hit a national average of 4.59 on Friday. Gas prices have risen literally every month since Joe Biden took office. Federal data out this month shows that Americans are also paying 10% more for food than a year ago. If you think the current food price increases are painful, I think they're just starting. Those higher prices are helping drive the president's approval ratings lower. A new Associated Press poll finds that 67 percent of Americans disapprove of his handling of the economy. But one economist says the president isn't the one to blame. 95 percent of what happens in the economy with growth, with inflation, etc., has nothing to do with the White House. It's all driven in the private sectors. That AP poll finds that President Biden's overall approval rating stands at 39 percent, the lowest of his presidency. In Washington, Caroline Shively, News 11. After a string of confirmed cases across Europe and the United Kingdom, the U.S. has its first confirmed case of monkeypox. A second potential case now under investigation. News 11's Anna Eliopoulos has details. Health officials in New York City investigating a potential case of monkeypox just days after Massachusetts officials confirmed the first case in the U.S. this year. The male patient, currently admitted at Massachusetts General Hospital, is said to be in stable condition. We don't know how the patient acquired this infection, and that's why we're working closely with public health authorities. Monkeypox is typically found in West and Central Africa, but recent cases, without any known ties to Africa, have been popping up across Europe. There have been seven confirmed cases in the UK alone in the last month. Health officials say the patient in the US had only recently traveled to Canada, where there are no known clusters. A number of people in different places have all seemed to come down with it at the same time. And for some of them, there's not an obvious link as to where they got it from. Symptoms of monkeypox are flu-like and include fever, chills and swelling of the lymph nodes, progressing to rash and lesions on the face and body. Most infections last two to four weeks. Infectious disease professionals say monkeypox is rare and it's not a virus that spreads easily. Transmission can occur through bodily fluids, respiratory droplets and sexual contact. We have decades of evidence studying this virus, looking at outbreaks. Um, we have multiple vaccines for it. We have some medications that appear to work against pox viruses. Anna Eliopoulos, News 11. Next on News 11 at 4, it's steamy and summer-like right now, but it's about to become a March chill that's returning to the area with a cold front. We'll let you know when it will arrive and what kind of thunderstorms, if they'll be strong, severe, or just garden variety.
We weren't the only ones in the Midwest to get rocked by yesterday's storms. Check out this video from Minnesota and Wisconsin. This first clip is from western Wisconsin and followed by some video from southern Minnesota where there were reports of golf ball sized hail. And then this video taken in downtown Minneapolis yesterday. It shows a river of hail flowing down the street. Time now to check in again with Chief Meteorologist John Fuller. John, no scenes like that in our area, but as we showed you earlier in the broadcast, we do have those tree limbs down in many spots. Tree limbs down, seven tornadoes, two EF1s yesterday, of course, and five uh, ef zero so far, and they're still doing the surveys, Mike. Yeah, so a little bit of a respite today, but another round of thunderstorms on the way later on tonight. Those shouldn't be so impactful. Uh, the ones, I think, tomorrow afternoon will be a little more impactful and you can see the uh, timeline of the thunderstorm probability a good indication of the waves of energy and when they'll move through the region so i think if you have evening plans this evening you're in great shape and uh, shouldn't see any significant thunderstorm activity until well after midnight sure a stray one may pop ahead of that but it's uh, tonight lesser chances for severe weather and a little better chance on Saturday afternoon as the cool frontal system slips across the area. So highest probability of rain and thunderstorms on Saturday. There will be some dry time, but not a whole lot on Saturday. And then Tuesday and Wednesday, we see some more cool air and rain showers. Here are just a few of the tornado uh, reports and the weather service during doing the site surveys. Let's go in and inspect at least one of them. Uh, this was 458 Glendale, Kirkwood, Missouri. Uh, that's where they found EF0 uh, damage, a uh, tornado uh, damage that moved northeastward before dissipating near Brentwood. Mostly tree damage was observed uh, along its path. And we go here very close to uh, our station, not far away anyway. Uh, Maryland Heights, uh, EF0, zero uh, just north of Creve Coeur, which damaged power poles and some trees. We widen things out and take a look at any uh, severe weather or rain showers in our area. And you can see the cool frontal system that is on the way. Notice how the rain is lining up in the uh, thunderstorm activity that you saw from Minneapolis off to uh, the west is now over northern Michigan. This is more of a summertime severe weather situation for northern Michigan once you get into Minnesota. Thunderstorms developing late being more common after midnight. I think the peak will be around 3 o'clock in the morning with this cool front system that's waiting for some energy. For now a chunk of energy up to the north and east. Here's the one that will slide along the front and pull it through and create the uplift as the components come together. And uh, Denver, Colorado, several inches of snow expected there. It won't stick around long, but it will be an impact for the evening commute and overnight. We have a level one chance for severe weather as we head into uh, Saturday from St. Louis North down to the south as the front slips through. It'll run into that steamy air and that'll result in some stronger thunderstorms. Here's a time lapse from St. Anne, Lambert St. Louis International. It is getaway Friday and it's summer like steamy 88 degrees here only 66 in Kansas City 90s down to the south. Notice the 30s 40s up to the north and west. So this is going to be a significant cool down as we head through Saturday night into Sunday. But now it's summer like officially at Lambert. Temperatures 88, wind south southwest, heat index is 91. Allergy count for today, mold 43,000. That's high. Grass is high too. And uh, during the evening hours, that front will be approaching. Notice how those thunderstorms blossom after midnight tonight. That's one wave, settles down, and then Saturday afternoon, the focus should be to uh, the south with some of those thunderstorms stronger. But look at the cool down, Sunday's highs only in the 60s. So showers and thunders becoming more numerous after midnight, low down to 66. Tomorrow, partly cloudy to variably cloudy skies, scattered thunderstorms, a better chance in the afternoon. High temperature, you're looking at uh, only 74, 51 the low, 67 on Sunday, Monday partly cloudy, and then unsettled and wet weather into Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday. Mike? John, thank you.
Kharkiv is Ukraine's second largest city and it continues to take fire from Russian forces. Trey Yangst visited a village recently liberated by the Ukrainian army. The report contains images you may Alexander find disturbing. Alexander Bobadyahov opens the door of his stable, revealing the body of a Ukrainian soldier. When I saw him, I felt a lump in my throat, he says. I've got kids of the same age. The 59-year-old returned to the village of Vilhovka yesterday, only to find his home destroyed and many of his friends missing. Citizens on our street were forcefully deported, Alexander explains. There were cars with Russian license plates and people were forced in. Nearby, we meet Zoya Gavrilov. She hid underground until this area was liberated by Ukrainian troops. I didn't see it because I was in the basement, she starts to say. You can hear some of that artillery still coming in. It must be difficult to hear that all the time. In the distance, Russian troops are about 10 miles from this location. They've been pushed back by the Ukrainians, but still this area remains part of the battlefield. Down the street at a school, the body of a Russian soldier lays face up in the grass. This building was used as a headquarters for the Russians before being retaken by the Ukrainian army. You can see the level of destruction at this school. Russian forces were here for weeks as they attempted to take Ukraine's second largest city of Kharkiv. Ukrainian forces were able to push them back, but the destruction left behind is significant. You can see here almost nothing left. Despite fierce battles for Kharkiv, the city remains in Ukrainian hands, and the Ukrainian army remains in high spirits. Everything is amazing. Everybody is happy. Everybody welcomes us, one soldier explains. Everybody is happy we liberated them. On an average day, it would take about 30 minutes to drive to Russia from Kharkiv. It gives you a sense of just how close the enemy is for those Ukrainian troops. In Kharkiv, Trey Yinkst, News 11. Bomberito Automotive Group Skyfox over this farm in Greenville, Illinois this morning. News 11's Patrick Clark will have an update on cleanup efforts there and elsewhere in the Metro East. Families burned out of their apartments but saying they have no other choice but to return here. We're following up on these unbearable conditions. Some breaking news this hour. St. Louis Mayor Tashara Jones reports an attempted break-in at her home overnight. She says it happened around 3.30 this morning. 
Mayor Jones reported that a person tried to break through a screen at her home. She called public safety officials and North Patrol District personnel responded. They say police had a similar report at another house in the neighborhood, so they do not believe this was a targeted incident, at least not right now. And this was the view this morning in Warson Woods on Reindeer Drive. It is near where the EF0 tornado touched down in Kirkwood last night. Multiple cars were crushed by trees and another big tree was uprooted in a backyard laying across trampolines there. News 11 meteorologist Jamie Travers live in Kirkwood with more of a look at that damage. Jamie. Yes, well, Mike, uh, we are actually now we moved to Orson Woods, but we have been looking at all of the damage in this area. Plenty was left behind. Plenty of damage was left behind from one of those EF zero tornadoes that first touched down northeast of Kirkwood and then continued north to the Warson Woods area. Residents here cleaning up, but this street looks much, much better than it did just a few hours ago. The sounds of spring after storms roll through and the hours stack up for local crews. It's going to be a long day, probably a good 10, 11 hour day. Numerous crews working to clean serious tree damage from Kirkwood to Warson Woods. Kirkwood resident Emily Carter lives a few blocks from the damage and took shelter in her basement. We walk by here all the time and it's just amazing. Yeah, how quickly your life can change. <laughs> he was fine and I mean, in minutes, half hour, everything was over. Today's cleanup piling on to an already heavy workload. So I'm still playing catch up from my, the storms last year, believe it or not. I mean, it's just, yeah. We're over 100 jobs deep still. People have been very patient understanding with the storms from last year, and now we're already getting the storms this year. Down the road in Warson Woods, resident Tom fire. Miller had three, three large so trees fall on his property. Crushed one of our cars, our work car, and then another work car that we have. Second tree kind of came over and hit that one as well. We've lived here 20 years, and these trees were probably 60 plus years old, and you just don't replace 60 year old trees. Disappointed about that, but more importantly, no one was hurt. And residents, as you can see, are still out here cleaning up, but at least the large trees have been cleared off the property. That house that we're looking at, that was the one who lost those three trees, and that's a damage to two of those cars. But like we said, ever all of that can be replaced. Luckily, no lives were lost because we had a lot of storms last night. As we were mentioning, seven tornadoes have been confirmed by the National Weather Service. Reporting live in Warson Woods, meteorologist Jamie Travers, News 11. And this is video taken in Freeburg, Illinois this morning. Many homeowners there found their yards covered with trees, branches and other debris. But Freeburg is far from the only Illinois community cleaning up today. This is Bomberito Automotive Sky Fox video this morning of a church in Belleville, Illinois. You can see the damage of the roof and on the ground next to that church. That is where we find News 11's Patrick Clark continuing our team coverage this afternoon. Patrick. Yeah, Mike, we've been all over Illinois this afternoon, seeing some of the damage from that storm yesterday, like right here in Belleville, as you mentioned, Faith Baptist Church, they're trying to get a tarp over this part of the roof that was exposed due to the high winds last night. And we're just finding out from uh, meteorologist Jamie Travers and the National Weather Service that was an tornado, an EF1 that touched down in Greenville, Illinois. We've had wind storms blow a little shed down and grain bins and stuff but not destruction like this like i said that shed back there is completely gone and that's where the animals were at high winds are to blame for the damage to this farm in bond county illinois ah! this sheep farmer in greenville losing three sheds thursday during the dinner hour and some of his sheep initially i didn't go out because the power lines were down but then as soon as I was able to come out, I was devastated. Friday, this family working to get a makeshift shed to house these sheep, which they plan to sell. I'm going to have to probably sell all my sheep. Start over. Kurt Eversgerd saying they're grateful that their house and their lives were spared. Do you think it was a tornado? Oh, it almost definitely had to be. It sounded like a train when it come through. And just outside Lebanon on Highway 50, power lines pushed to the side. The electric company working Friday afternoon. 
Yeah, well, we saw a number of trees with broken limbs and pushed over uh, when we were over near Greenville and then on our way to Lebanon and then here in Belleville, where, as you can see, those guys working at that Faith Baptist Church losing part of their roof last night. In Belleville, Illinois, Patrick Clark, News 11. More families say they are stuck living in a burned out building. News 11 Chris News 11 investigator Chris Hayes helped one man yesterday and he heard from more desperate families today. These apartments on Enright burned the day after Mother's Day after an arson in an apartment behind me. We helped the man across the hall get a new home, but residents downstairs say they're still stuck. The smell the smoke is all in the walls. Janae Brown says it's too smoky to reconnect her fire alarm. I had to take it out because the smoke was so strong, they kept it going off. We are inside the St. Luke's Plaza Apartments, a 24-unit building struck by an arson fire May 9th. Firefighters rescued several residents and police caught the suspected arsonist who's now in jail on a felony charge. Wednesday, more than a week after the fire, we learned some families had nowhere else to go and we featured this man's story. This is the apartment where the fire started. I live right here. And I'm still living here. Aaron Walker got results right after our interview. Apartment management got him a new place in a different building nearby, and he was moving today. Thank you, and I hope the people downstairs get, you know, apartments and places to live and stuff because it's bad. About a half dozen apartments appear to remain occupied. A lot of people really can't believe it. This man, who did not want to be identified, says he's too busy earning a paycheck to fight for himself to get out. I work a lot, so I, I try to keep my mind off all this that's going on. I work and pretty much sleep. I this irritating to me. A local doctor told Fox 2 short-term exposure to soot can damage your airways and long-term it can contribute to respiratory disease. Management told us today they agree no one should be living in this building and they're working as fast as they can to find safe places for those remaining. The complex includes other apartment buildings nearby not impacted by the fire. It seemed strange though. We noticed the leasing office overnight put up these new balloons and signs. It says leasing, like, which means units is available. Apartment management told Fox 2 off camera, it does not mean a new applicant will get an apartment before someone who's currently in a burned out unit. They said cleanup continues at a rapid pace and they will get the remaining people out of this smoke filled apartment building any day now. Chris Hayes, News 11. Well, we had quite the extreme weather day. Check out this video from about 5 o'clock yesterday afternoon showing a drone view of the ominous skies in the Maryland Heights area. Time to check in again with Chief Meteorologist John Fuller. He is live outside on the Lakeside Renovation and Design Weather Deck. John? Yeah, that drone video courtesy of Kenny Reese. Thank you, Kenny, for sharing that video. And our spotters uh, and viewers sending in terrific snapshots of the thunderstorms, severe thunderstorms, and overall so far seven tornado uh, reports and confirmation by the National Weather Service. And uh, they were impressive, mainly EF uh, zero tornadoes with winds 80 to 85 miles per hour. But of the seven, there were two EF ones, one in uh, Leslie, Missouri, 100 mile per hour winds with that one. And Breeze, Illinois, Greenville, Illinois, you saw Patrick Clark's uh, story on that. And poor farmers out there lost some sheds and uh, buildings. Tonight, the skies are partly cloudy. Temperatures are warm. You can feel the humidity when you walk outside. But there is a breeze, a warm south breeze ahead of a cold north breeze. That's part of a front that's going to bring snow to sections of Colorado, Denver specifically. And up over northern Michigan, uh, they have seen hail today. Yesterday it was in Minnesota. Checking the radar right now, looking closely. Uh, no uh, thunderstorms popping right now, but there is a huge temperature contrast from uh, southeast to northwest. In Kansas City, it's 66. Warm and humid upper 80s across uh, southern portions of Missouri, even some 90s out there. So the timeline for the rain and thunderstorms, we'll see some scattered activity after 10 o'clock. But notice how it fills in after 3 o'clock in the morning. A little bit of a lull and then things pick up during the afternoon and evening. And those will probably have a stronger punch, especially south and east of Metro St. Louis. 
where uh, you'll run into uh, more heat. And the modeling verifies that with rain and thunderstorms, the 3, 4 o'clock in the morning. Then the next round later in the evening will be uh, later in the afternoon will be more impressive, but cooler and clearing skies for Sunday. This evening, increasing clouds with scattered thunderstorms in a kind of a spotty fashion after 10 o'clock, filling in later on tonight with a low of 66 in your extended forecast. Sunday remains the pick day of the weekend. A little autumn chill in there, 67 the high, 50 the low. Some spots will dip into the 40s, Mike. Thanks, John. Time now to check in with Amelia Magavaro for real-time traffic. Thanks, Mike. And thankfully, we're not tracking any crashes, but we are tracking some slowdowns if you're heading out from work and getting a start on your weekend. So let's check those out. You're going to look at 6440, and the intersections of 270 and 170 are going to be your slowest go. It looks like you're only going to be traveling 40 miles per hour on 270, and then only 12 miles per hour on the intersection of 170 and 6440. So let's take a look at the traffic cameras. This is a look at 270 and 64. You can see that southbound direction definitely a lot slower, uh, heavy volume of traffic there, and then that eastbound direction is going to be a little bit slower for you on 6440. So again, no crashes, but definitely some slowdowns. The 44 uh, westbound direction is going to be a little bit slower for you, and then I have to show this, the 55 and Loughborough uh, intersections there. That was underwater not too long ago, about a day ago, so it's amazing what a difference a day makes. Now it's uh, good traffic in both directions there. Here's the check of the rest of your metro, though. Uh, this is a look at your commute. It looks like you're not too bad if you're heading from downtown St. Louis to the Blanchet Bridge, less than 20 minutes for that. But then you're going to be a little bit slower go on 270. That southbound direction from 6440 to 55 will take you 14 minutes. Mike. All right, Amelia, thanks. Are you looking for a weekend escape? Downton Abbey fans have been anticipating this weekend's movie release for months. Did it win over movie critics? Dean Richards tells us if Downton Abbey made his Dean's List when News 11 at 4 continues.
The weekend Downton Abbey fans have been waiting for has arrived. Movie critic Dean Richards gives us a first look at the long-awaited film. Years ago, before you were born, I met a man. They spend a few days together and he gives her a house. You never thought to turn it down? Do I look as if I'd turned down a villa in the south of France? I came to the Downton Abbey table late in its UK and US TV success. It was well on its way to winning its 15 Primetime Emmy Awards, which spurred the 2019 movie of the same name in which the stately aristocratic estate was paid a visit by the Queen. Within just a few minutes, I felt like I knew and loved the Earl and Countess of Grantham, the other friends and family, the downstairs staff of loyal domestic help, but especially the matriarch of the family, the Duke's unpredictable and outspoken mother, Violet, played by Oscar winner Maggie Smith. She she has, and still does, steal every scene she's in. Just like then, you still don't need a history with Downton Abbey to love and appreciate it, but if you have one, it makes it all the more enjoyable. Its engaging, clever writing immediately draws you into its two basic storylines, one following the family to the south of France, where it's been learned that the octogenarian Violet has inherited a gorgeous villa from a man she apparently once knew very well 60 years ago. Since most of the family has gone to see the villa and try to learn the secret behind their mum's past with this man, the villa itself has been rented to an American silent movie-making company who wants to use the estate's beauty for their latest production. Only silent films are on their way out and talkies are all on the way in. All of that has the staff and the film crew buzzing as the other subplot plays out. And play out they do. But what actually happens here isn't as pivotal as how it plays out with these characteristically lovable characters. All of the satisfaction comes from the natural charm and chemistry of this cast, along with the film's inherent civility. Visiting this proper world is a lovely two-hour escape from our angst-filled one. Not a stuffy, Brit-filled world, but a clever and at times funny and even touching world. I'm highly recommending Downton Abbey, A New Era. It's a Dean's List B+, in theaters only. Well, you can always get my movie reviews and home video pics sent right to your phones every week just by texting the word Dean to 97999. I hope you have a great weekend. In Chicago, I'm Dean Richards. Straight ahead in sports, it is time for the Major League debut of one of the Cardinals' top prize prospects. Plus, the Blues riding high after breaking through with a win over Colorado.
The Blues bounced back in a big way, beating Colorado in game two of their playoff series. It was a nearly perfect effort, shutting down the high-powered avalanche offense and evening up the series. Blues trying to snap a playoff losing streak to Colorado that dates back to nearly two decades. After a scoreless first, the Blues grabbed the lead on that Jordan Cairo goal. It was his fifth of the postseason. And before the second period ended, the Blues had this five on three power play, a huge opportunity and a huge goal. David Perron gets the pass and goal from his favorite spot on the ice. A little bit later, they would do it again. David Perron on the break. He scores that one to give a little more cushioning to the Blues. And they did it again last night. Victorious in their game two in Colorado. They now shift the series back to St. Louis for game three tomorrow night at Enterprise Center. Sports director Martin Kilcoin was in Denver and brings us this post game report. Craig Berube's pregame comment was, we're going to have the puck more, and we're going to do more with it. And the Blues did. An impressive, thorough 4-1 win over Colorado, evening this series at a game apiece. Well, it's big. I think, you know, you look back to last year, they beat us four straight, then they beat us the first game. That's five in a row. Um, you know, I think guys realize, you know, we've got to step up and we've got to beat this team. So they did tonight. That's really what it boils down to. They went into the game tonight um, hungry and weren't going to be denied. Uh, it's playoffs right there for you, the big roller coaster. Obviously, we didn't feel uh, good about ourselves uh, last game. Uh, we probably had two or three players that had good games. That was it. And uh, tonight, we had a lot more guys. And, uh, yeah, it was important to, to find a way to win one here on the road, just like we did last time uh, against Minnesota, and uh, kind of keep pushing forward here. Yeah, it's a big win, and uh, you know it's a great response by us, and I think that's the most important thing right there. It's a long series, and um, we know it's going to be a long series, and we're going to play hard every game, and uh, now we're, we just got to get some rest and prepare for the next match. Jordan Bennington didn't have to make 51 saves, but he did stop 30 of 31 shots. Another rock-solid performance by the Blues goalie. And now, Game 3, back at Enterprise Center on Saturday night. In Denver, at Ball Arena, Martin Kilcoin, Fox 2 Sports. On to baseball now, where the Cardinals are in Pittsburgh for the weekend. And that is music to baseball fans' ears, especially as the Cardinals have been a bit reeling lately. Here's the lineup. Tonight, it is the Major League debut for Nolan Gorman. The former first-round pick will play second base and hit sixth. Tommy Edmond makes the move to shortstop, and Adam Wainwright is on the mound. We'll be right back with more.
Natasha Benningfield releases a new version of one of her hit songs. Margot Robbie lines up her next gig and more. Kristen Goodwin has the latest from the Hollywood Nation. To be forgiven. Barry keeps his day job. Robbie books her next gig and Benningfield shares in the Hollywood Nation. I am unwritten. Natasha Bedingfield has dropped a special treat for her fans before hitting the road to host and perform on the Masked Singer National Tour kicking off May 28th. The Grammy-nominated singer-songwriter released a new acoustic version of her classic hit, Unwritten. As much as my song has been played, and as many times that I've played it live, I never actually recorded in a studio uh, like a proper version, uh, Natasha's version. Uh, so I'm excited. A new Ocean's Eleven film is in the works with Margot Robbie. According to The Hollywood Reporter, the actress will star and produce in a new installment of the heist franchise, which is still in early development. It will be an original movie set in Europe in the 1960s. I need a purpose. And HBO is keeping their popular hitman a little longer. The network has renewed its Emmy-winning dark comedy series, Barry, for a fourth season. Bill Hader plays a contract killer turned actor, desperately trying to leave his violent past behind to pursue his passion in acting. The season three finale airs June 12th. You look good. So do you. Kristen Goodwin. Our high today, a steamy 89 degrees, morning low 69, and a trace of precipitation. Nothing on local radar right now, although we are seeing clouds increase from northwest to southeast. As the cool front system uh, dives our way, it's only 66 in Kansas City. We have readings near 90 degrees, and this evening it remains warm. And then late evening, a chance for an isolated thunderstorm more likely after midnight, and then a scattering of thunderstorms into a Saturday. Saturday afternoon as well. Mike? All right, John, thanks, and thanks for joining us for News 11 at 4. We'll see you back here tonight at 7. Have a great evening. Coverage you can count on. This is Fox 2 News at 5. A slow moving cold front is our nemesis for the weekend. We'll check on our chances of rain and storms. A chorus of chainsaws could be heard in this Kirkwood neighborhood today. A look at the damage left behind from the EF0 tornado and how cleanup is going. Heard a loud noise and heard some banging, and we went to the basement. 
Three barns destroyed here in Bond County. We're checking out storm damage across the state of Illinois. Surveillance video captures the timeline as a suspect runs from police and causes a crash that killed a family of five on Mother's Day. One of the most important tools we use to warn the public about severe weather has been failing at an alarming rate. We'll show you what that tool is and what's being done to fix it in the summer outlook. Plus, hear how effective the Pfizer booster shot is for children and why an infectious disease specialist says now is the time for parents to get their young ones the booster. Thank you for joining us for Fox 2 News at 5. I'm Jasmine Huda. And I'm Dick Faust. First on Fox at 5 this Friday, clean up, recovery, and worries about more to come. This was the flooding during the severe weather on Interstate 55 at Loughborough yesterday. There were seven tornadoes in the area last night, and now there's concern about more rain this evening. Meteorologist Angela Huddy is here with what you need to know. Angela, what a night we had yesterday, and then we have more events on the way. Seven confirmed tornadoes so far, and we'll break down uh, the locations of those that have been confirmed by the National Weather Service coming up here in just a little bit. You mentioned the flash flooding yesterday in several spots, just a mess of weather. Now the good news here on our Friday evening is that we're getting a little bit of a break. Most of the day has been dry, had a couple of stray showers earlier in the morning, but we're dry right now and I think it's going to take a couple of more hours before our next round of precipitation begins to build here in the St. Louis area. So let's bring